You're listening to the Mind Over Murder podcast. My name is Bill Thomas. I'm a writer, consulting producer, and now podcaster. I am now trying to use my experience as the brother of a murder victim to help other victims of violent crime. I'm working on a book on the unsolved Colonial Parkway murders, and I'm the co-administrator of the Colonial Parkway Murders Facebook group, together with Kristen Dilley. My name is Kristen Dilley. I'm a writer, a researcher, a teacher, and a victim's advocate, as well as the social media manager and co-administrator for the Colonial Parkway Murders Facebook page with my partner in crime, Bill Thomas. Welcome to Mind Over Murder. I'm Kristen Dilley. And I'm Bill Thomas. Continuing our coverage of the Lisk case, that's Long Island serial killer, for anybody who is not currently following the news. Uh, And we've got a couple of different stories to talk about today. Bill, what are you making of all of this coverage on the Long Island serial killing case? Were you aware of this case before it became so big in the news a couple of weeks ago? Oh, I've been following this case for years, and folks that we knew, Billy Jensen and others, had also been covering this case in quite some depth. And I always thought that this was a case that was overdue for additional attention. Of course, law enforcement in Suffolk County had been a complete disaster and had really failed the people of Suffolk County and Nassau County, for that matter, in terms of moving this case forward. And it's only finally with the establishment of the new task force and new leadership, both at the district attorney level and at the chief level for the Suffolk County Police Department, were we finally able to see significant progress made in this case. It's fair to say that I have been following this case for several years at a minimum. And I was familiar with it because I had a number of friends introduce the book Lost Girls by Robert Kolker to me. Sadly, it has been sitting on my shelf for quite a while because I have far more books than I can actually get to at any given time. And this wasn't something that was immediately on my radar. Now, of course, that we are covering this case. I have pulled that book off my shelf and it has been given sort of primo status. And that is something that I'm looking forward into delving into. I had had somewhat of the same issue with Lost Girls. I had also watched several television series about the case, which were quite interesting. And it's very tragic. You've got 11 people, including nine women, one man, and a child found scattered along the Long Island coast and seemingly no answers. There were a lot of questions. Is this one serial killer? Is it two? Could Long Island actually have two competing serial killers operating at the same time? Certainly the arrest of Rex Hewerman has got this case moving forward again. Like you, I found myself reaching for Colker's book, Lost Girls, pulling it off the shelf and moving it to the top of the to-be-read pile. We should mention a couple of things before we start talking about these stories. Now, at the time that we are recording, these are breaking news stories. By the time this gets to you, our listeners, they will not be breaking news stories anymore. They will be a couple of weeks old because we are going through the process of building a lot of content as I get ready to go back to school. So I I would call this a true crime news update, except by the time it gets to you, the news will not be news anymore. It will have been several weeks past. Just please be aware of the limitations and know that it's news when we recorded it. It just won't be when you hear it. And the second thing that we want to mention is in our episodes in which we read the bail application for Rex Hewerman, we had theorized as to the identities of the two forensic laboratories that did some of the work in this case. We had posited that one of the labs was Astrea and one of the labs was Othram. In the time since, the New York Times has outed our friends at Othram as being one of the labs that did do the work. So in case you have not heard or have not seen the New York Times coverage, it has been confirmed that one of those two forensic labs mentioned in the bail application is our friends at Othram Labs. And again, all we can say to them is great job, guys. Please keep it up. You're doing amazing work. I'd be willing to bet you a nice dinner that the hair work done 
was done by Estrella because they are the leading hair lab in the country and have developed highly innovative techniques just in the last few years, allowing them to extract nuclear DNA from the shaft of hair. I am 99% certain, although they have not yet been outed in the media coverage. And remember, this case will ultimately probably go to trial. A lot more information will come out in the coming months about who else has worked this case. But I would say very strong chance that Astrea Labs in California did the hair work. Yeah, I agree with you. So we have three stories that we're going to get into today with regard to the Lisk case that is going to include reporting from the New York Times, from People Magazine, and from CNN. And we will include links to all of that in our show notes as we go. So the first big development in the case is that prosecutors have identified the human remains that were found in 2011 near Gilgo Beach. And so Othram did the work on this, and they have identified the victim that was known as Fire Island Jane Doe. They have identified her as Karen Vergata, a 34-year-old escort from Manhattan who went missing on Valentine's Day in 1996. I was interested to note that there was no missing persons report filed on her after she disappeared. I find that sad and upsetting. Her legs were found. I hate the idea of disarticulated bodies. I think that's one of the reasons why I was weird about this case. I hate the idea of remains and disarticulated bodies. Her legs were found in a black trash bag on Fire Island in April of 1996. That is two months after her disappearance in February. And her skull was found on Tobey Beach around the same time that the remains from 10 other individuals were found there, including the victims now known as the Gilgo Four. So that puts that around 2010. This is a terrible story and a terrible aspect to the Gilgo Beach story so far, which is that for a number of these earlier victims, their bodies were cut up and distributed in various places, sometimes as far apart as 40 miles. And this is one of those situations with Karen Vergata, where her legs were found in a black trash bag, as you said, on Fire Island, hence the Fire Island Jane Doe name. And then it's not until 2010 that the rest of her remains were found as part of the ongoing search for victims near Gilgo Beach. Cause of death has not been listed in her case. I'm assuming it's going to take a little bit longer to find that out. The Lisk suspect, Rex Hewerman, has not been named as a person of interest in her death, I would say, yet. I'm hoping they're going to find a way to link him to more of these victims, but as of this moment, they have not named him as a person of interest and no other suspect has been named as a person of interest in her murder at this time. It's interesting to note that the DNA profile was created in October, 2022 for the task force by Othram. They'd been working on it for a couple of months. Othram did the science, the DNA extraction, And then I believe the FBI forensic genetic genealogy team did the actual searching of databases to determine Ms. Vergata's identity. So we don't have a whole lot more in this case, but it is our hope that as the investigation continues to unfold and Othram continues to do its work, I'm sure they're doing more of it than just this. I'm hoping that means that more and more sus- more and more victims will be identified and we can start giving names to some of the disarticulated bodies that were found all up and down the Long Island shore. I do know that to be the case and they are continuing the work. As far back as October 2022, they believe they may have found the family group for Peaches, one of the other unidentified victims, and they were looking at a family in the Atlanta area, if I'm not mistaken. However, it's a complicated family tree. So tracing back to individuals who might be able to provide a current DNA sample for that family has been 
I would say slow going because it's a very complicated family tree is how it's been put to me. We are very hopeful, though, that with the excellent work that Othram is doing and with the help of Estrella, of course, and the FBI labs, that more victims' names are going to come out here fairly soon and that that process will continue until all of the individuals involved here are identified. We wanted to turn to a happier story related to the Long Island serial killings, and that is that is a report that came in from People Magazine, the good folks over there, who have reported, I, I think this is about as happy a story as you can possibly get in relation to a serial killing case. The article that we're referencing for this is from People Magazine. It is titled, Daughter of Happy Face Killer Starts GoFundMe to Help Go-Go Beach Suspect's Wife. For anybody who's been around in the true crime space or been to CrimeCon, you probably recognize the name Melissa Jesperson Moore. Melissa Moore is the daughter of the Happy Face Killer, Keith Jesperson. If you know that name, it may be because you watched the TV series Dark Minds starring M. William Phelps. Keith Jesperson was the serial killer known only as Raven during that TV series. Melissa Jesperson Moore has spoken freely, both at CrimeCon and on her own platform, about the trauma that's carried by families of serial killers. Of course, she's in a very good place here to talk about what Rex Hurman's family may be experiencing. In a 2015 interview for the TV series 2020, Melissa Moore stated that relatives of killers are secondary crime victims. In her interview, she said, we carry the shame and we want to remove that. I feel in a sense that I'm related to my father, but I didn't cause the pain. But knowing that my father caused some pain causes me pain. Got to be a pretty complicated emotion, I would imagine. Sometimes I'll hear people express a real lack of sympathy for people like Melissa Jesperson Moore. I struggle with this one a little bit, but I do understand that Melissa or any family member of a killer They're not responsible for what their relatives have done, whether they're the daughter or son or father or mother, for that matter. Any relative, how incredibly difficult and painful this must be. It is such a strange position to be put in, and I think that is a secondary branch of the club that nobody wants to join. Nobody wants to be the victim or the family member to a victim of a murder, but certainly I can't imagine what it is like to be the son or daughter, or as you mentioned, mother or father of a serial killer. So Melissa Moore launched a GoFundMe for the family of Lisk suspect Rex Hewerman. Those are his ex-wife, or soon-to-be ex-wife, I should say, Asa Allerup, 59, and her two adult children, and those are the beneficiaries. I went to check on the GoFundMe earlier today. They surpassed their first goal of $25,000, and they're headed toward the $50,000 mark right now. And I did go ahead and put a link up on our Mind Over Murder page for anybody who's interested in taking a look at the GoFundMe. It does contain some information from Melissa Moore and some discussion about why she actually started the GoFundMe. This is in part a response to the media coverage of what Rex Hurman's family came back to after that intensive 12-day police search on their home. The pictures that I saw after that search were really disheartening because they came home to a mess beyond their imagining. I absolutely could not believe how utterly trashed the place was. Now, I understand they're looking for evidence in a series of homicides. I get that. But it looked like the whole entire place had been ransacked beyond belief. In a statement to People magazine, Ms. Ellerup said, quote, I had three cats. Litter boxes were a strew thrown on top of everything. My pictures were thrown all over the place. My couch was completely shredded. I don't even know if there's any parts to the couch left. So it's looking, just based on those photos, that Asa and her children are having to essentially start over start from scratch, rebuilding even basic household needs. I guess, honestly, one thing that I had never really taken into consideration as part of a search for clues and evidence is what that must do to the house when you have a crew in there searching for evidence for 12 solid days. I don't know if that had ever crossed my mind. Bill, had it crossed yours? 
No, I don't think so. I do understand how the house could effectively be dismantled, though, because they were really taking a close look and with this suspect being an architect and having lived in that house for decades. That's actually the house I believe he grew up in. And there was a concern that there could be hidden evidence. So that required a tremendous amount of destruction, I would say, in order to look into every nook and cranny of that house. I want to quote from Melissa's GoFund page. She says, quote, today I have an opportunity to use my voice to help Asa, who isn't in a place to speak about the terror and horror she and her family are experiencing at this moment. While people may assume Asa has the funds to start a new life, the assumption is just that. The funds are to support Asa, and she can direct on what is the highest priority, basic needs for herself and adult children, to restore the home as a whole, as evidence collection damaged or destroyed many critical household items, divorce costs, and any other needs she may have that is not listed here. So it looks like she's really trying to make sure that Issa and her two kids have everything that they might need so that they can escape from this previous life with Rex Huerman and start something brand new. I understand that people may not be as sympathetic as they might, but I think if you step back a little bit, as much as we might be shocked by this horrible series of crimes and the recent arrest of Rex Hewerman. As far as we can tell, investigators don't believe that Asa, his wife, has any role in this series of murders whatsoever, nor do his children, who are both adults at this point. I hope that we can all look at this and realize that these people, the wife, the two children, are victims too. Absolutely. I think that's a great place to leave that on. And then our third story with relation to the Long Island serial killer today is one that I had not heard about. I think that's largely because I have not yet had a chance to read Robert Kolker's book, Lost Girls. But the reporting from CN here was truly excellent. And I was really, I don't want to say I was happy to read the story. I was moved by this story. And it definitely continued this idea that a crime does not just happen to one person. It happens to whole families. It causes concentric circles to ripple outward from it. We're going to quote from a story from CNN titled Unintended Hero, a mother's quest to find her daughter led to the eventual arrest of the suspect in the Gilgo Beach serial killings. This particular piece from CN, this is a longer piece than what I normally expect from them, delves into the mother of Shannon Gilbert. Her name is Mari Gilbert, and she worked very hard as the family member of a first a missing person, then a murder victim, to bring attention to her daughter's case. And ultimately, she herself was murdered very tragically by another of her daughters. But I want to get into this very interesting story that came out of Shannon Gilbert's case. So for anyone who's not familiar with Shannon Gilbert, she went missing on May 1st, 2010, at the age of 23. Her remains were not found until December of 2011. At the same time that Shannon's remains were found, the remains of the other victims in the Gilgo 4 killings were found as well. So on the morning of her disappearance, Shannon had traveled with her driver from Manhattan to meet a client at the client's home in Oak Beach, Long Island. Bill, are you familiar enough with Long Island to tell like what is the relationship between Oak Beach and Gilgo Beach? Are they near each other? Yeah, they're quite close. They're along the same stretch of coastline. Okay. Shannon went to meet a client. Shannon was, like many of the other victims, a sex worker. I'm going to quote from CN here about the circumstances around Shannon's disappearance. Quote, Gilbert appeared irrational at some point, and the man contacted the driver, and this man would be the client she was going to see. According to a Suffolk County Police online summary of the Gilgo Beach homicide investigation, she fled on foot and approached two homeowners in the area before she vanished. At some point or another, when she was attempting to flee, we're not sure from what, she made a 911 call during which she screamed, they're trying to kill me. However, 
An analysis by the FBI and a psychiatrist of the 911 call Gilbert made at the time found that her death was not consistent with her being the victim of violence or of a violent offender. I I feel like we need to take a second and talk about that. I'm not sure where that came from. If someone makes a 911 call saying they're trying to kill me, why wouldn't you? I'm just concerned and curious. Why would that not be seen as a matter of concern to someone? If someone's trying to kill me, or I think someone's trying to kill me and I'm screaming it into the phone, why would they say that's not consistent with her being the victim of violence? I don't know. And then, of course, as the story continues, not just this story, but the coverage in general, Suffolk County police seem to believe that Shannon Gilbert was not ultimately a murder victim, which I think is ludicrous. You're listening to Mind Over Murder. We'll be right back after this word from our sponsors. We're back here at Mind Over Murder. Yeah, it's very frustrating and upsetting to me. Now, granted, okay, and I guess I had to say maybe we need to... Both Shannon's driver... And the man that she was visiting were investigated and cleared of any involvement in her death. At that point, the investigation into Shannon's disappearance just seemed to dry up, as you said, Bill. Any particular reason why that might be? I think this is where you just have to condemn that previous administration in Suffolk County in the strongest possible terms. I don't think they did a good job on any of these investigations, which is one of the reasons why this case dragged on for more than a decade. I think one of the reasons why this case didn't move forward is because these victims were sex workers and they were not taken seriously. One of the key players involved was quoted as saying that it was a good thing that this killer or killers were focusing on sex workers because that meant that everybody else was safe. Talk about treating these young women as disposable. To this day, Suffolk County has insisted that Shannon Gilbert's death was accidental, which I find extremely hard to understand, particularly since Dr. Michael Bodden, who's been a guest on our podcast, was asked by the family to conduct a private autopsy, and his findings were he thought that Shannon Gilbert had not died of exposure out there in the marsh, but had actually died as a result of homicidal violence. She's a murder victim, and yet it appears that the folks in Suffolk County, at least for the last decade or more, have blithely gone about their business thinking, oh, she had some sort of psychiatric breakdown and headed off into the marsh where she died from exposure. It's ludicrous. Shannon's mother, Mari, really went about putting pressure on the police to take her daughter's disappearance seriously. She said exactly what you did, Bill, that the investigators in the case were just dragging their feet and taking their time on it because the victims in the case were sex workers. I'm going to quote from Robert Kolker here. He is the author of Lost Girls, which is the book of record so far on the Long Island serial killer case. And he had this to say about Mari. Of all the family members, Mari was the one who got the most out of the police, forced them to do things they otherwise wouldn't. And she didn't just make a lot of noise. The experience of fighting on behalf of her daughter, Shannon, transformed Mari too. Mari was the one with the most provocative personality. She was the one who, when things started to get quiet, would stand up and make some noise and make sure the police responded. They reminded people that they were real human beings at stake here and that this was not just a Hannibal Lecter movie. I don't know, that sounds like somebody else I know, making noise (laughs) to remind the police that, hey, we're still here. I have no idea what you're talking about. So in 2016, Mari Gilbert and her family's lawyer held a press conference to announce the results of an independent autopsy, as you mentioned, performed by Dr. Michael Bodden, which found that Shannon's death was consistent with homicidal strangulation, but there still was no definitive cause of death listed. And as we talked about with Dr. Bodden a few weeks ago, he feels very strongly, and I'd have to agree, that his job, 
the job of the medical examiner, is to determine cause of death and provide as much information as possible, not necessarily to please the police. And as he said, medical examiners do work very closely with the police, but they have to be careful that their findings are not influenced by those close working relationships. He wasn't able to say definitively what the cause of death was, but he did believe that she was murdered and that it wasn't a matter of her wandering off into the marsh and dying of exposure. So Mari Gilbert has maintained over the years that her daughter was the victim of a homicide. Rather, unfortunately, and ironically, Mari herself became a homicide victim in July of 2016. Mari Gilbert was murdered by her daughter, Sarah. According to a forensic psychologist, Sarah was suffering from acute symptoms of schizophrenia at the time that she killed her mother. Sarah actually invited her mother to her home because she said she was hearing voices she stabbed Mari 277 times with a 15-inch kitchen knife, bludgeoned her to death with a fire extinguisher, and then sprayed the fire extinguisher foam into her mouth to drown her. I cannot imagine anything more awful or more tragic. A terrible story. And as you mentioned, that ripple effect, Kristen, this is an extreme and very sad example of how Shannon's death led to her sister's mental breakdown, and then ultimately to their mother, Mari's death. Yeah, the longtime attorney for the family, John Ray, stated that Sarah was driven mad quite substantially by the death of her beloved sister. She looked up to Shannon as a demigod, and she was brokenhearted by what happened, and it was all simmering in that mind all the time. Just terrible, awful, tragic circumstances here. CN actually referred to them as Hamlet-like circumstances, which points to them for the reference. So uh, on the morning of Mari's murder, the other there are th- four sisters in the family, all with S names, so that makes this a little more complicated. But Sherry stated that on the morning of Mari's murder, Sarah called her and told her that she was hearing voices referring to her mother as the devil and a bad god and directing her to kill her mother. Absolutely horrible. The youngest sister, Stevie, testified for the prosecution at her sister's trial, stating that Sarah's relationship with her mother was strained. At that point, her mother had obtained custody of Sarah's son following an incident in February 2016 in which Sarah drowned a puppy in front of her child. So clearly this was a long ongoing long-standing mental issue that needed to be taken care of. But it, she was described as having been mentally and emotionally disturbed by the death of her sister. So ultimately, Sarah was sentenced to 25 years to life in prison for the murder of her mother. Her lawyer tried for the insanity defense, but the jury ultimately said, we have no doubt the defendant suffers from a debilitating mental illness that blurs the line of fiction and reality and we are certainly sympathetic to the difficult life circumstances she has endured. The proof, however, reasonably supports the jury's finding that at the time of the killing, defendant had the substantial capacity to know and appreciate both the nature and consequences of her conduct, and that such conduct was wrong. Since that time, the two remaining members of the Gilbert family, Sherry and Stevie, have been the ones to carry the torch, as you will, with Shannon, Uh, in her case. So Sherry, who is the second oldest daughter, posted on the Facebook page praying for Shannon Gilbert with regard to Rex Heuerman's arrest. The time, effort, and dedication my mom and I put into this case wasn't wasted. I wished, hoped, and prayed for this day. I'm glad I'm still alive to see it. I hope that's some consolation. And many people actually feel that Shannon deserves credit for sparking the investigation into the Gilgo Beach Four and the Long Island serial killings, because had she not called 911 that night, this case might have never moved forward and those bodies might still be out there along Ocean Beach Boulevard with no one looking for them. Exactly. I'm going to let Robert Kolker, the author of Lost Girls, have the final word on this one. 
He said, quote, Mari understood that one way of finding at least a shred of meaning in the loss of her daughter was that her disappearance led to the discovery of those four women several months later, and that without Shannon, there would be no case and there would be no search for the killer. Exactly as you said, Bill, which means that Shannon herself is the unintended hero in the title of the CN article, but I would also argue that her mother, Mari, was also a hero as well in trying to keep her daughter's case alive and active. I'm just sorry that Mari's not alive today to see finally some small degree of justice moving forward in her daughter's disappearance and murder. Yeah, absolutely. There are so many facets to this case, Long Island Serial Killer Case or Gilgo 4, and we are going to continue to explore those. We hope that you have enjoyed our reporting so far. We've had our three episodes, and we've also had our delightful interview with Joe Jackalone, who is a expert on the list case, and we're looking forward to bringing you more coverage of stories related to this case as it continues to unfold over the next couple of months. Bill, any final words on the subject? No, I think that covers it. Well, that's going to do it for this episode of Mind Over Murder. If you like what we're doing here on the podcast, please leave us a rating or review, or preferably both, on any of the podcast platforms that you frequent. You can also buy our merchandise at Tee Public. Go look for Mind Over Murder and see what all we've got. You can get just about anything, t-shirts, mugs, sweatshirts, tote bags, all sorts of things. So please represent your favorite podcast by buying some of our merch. That's going to do it for this episode of Mind Over Murder. Thank you so much for listening. We'll see you next time. Mind Over Murder is a production of Absolute Zero and Another Dog Productions. Our executive producers are Bill Thomas and Kristen Dilley. Our logo art is by Pamela Arnois. Our theme music is by Kevin McLeod. Mind Over Murder is distributed in partnership with Crawl Space Media. You can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. You can also follow our page on the Colonial Parkway Murders on Facebook. And finally, you can follow Bill Thomas on Twitter at BillThomas56. Thank you for listening to Mind Over Murder.